Awesome. Well, it's so, so good to be here. Um, it's really hard for me to articulate how amazing it is to be here. Um, and I cried first service and almost cried second service, and I'm going to try really hard. Not, you know that ugly cry? Isn't that what girls say? That, this, that thing? I almost did that. So um, I don't want don't to do that all over you. Um, but uh, this... Uh, I, just to, to let you know, I, I love your church. Um, and what, gosh, I'm doing it right now. When I say I love your church, um, it comes from a place that I, I don't know if I can even describe it correctly, but I'll try with this. I remember in 2007, in the spring, sitting with Ted in his RV, writing bylaws, dreaming about a church that we might plant. And that was this church. And uh, so... Um, Oh, it's really great to be here. Um, what? Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's been 11 years since I preached here. Um, and this building didn't exist. A lot of you didn't. Well, you existed. <laughs> Just not in my relationship to me. But a lot of you did. You, you were here. And so it's really, really, really great uh, to be able to be here. So we're going to open our Bibles today to the book of Revelation. We're going to continue through our series in Revelation. If you don't have a Bible and you need one, Raise your hand, the ushers will get you one. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, we're going to be looking at the church of Smyrna, the church of Smyrna. Now, as we look at this, um, John, who's the author of the book of Revelation, he had a, a number of disciples, but one of them, his name was Polycarp. And Polycarp actually ended up becoming one of the pastors or the pastor of the church in Smyrna. Um, Polycarp actually ended up giving his life for his faith. He was martyred um, for the, the uh, crime of being a Christian, and even worse, he was a pastor. And uh, so Rome executed Polycarp uh, in 155 AD um, as the pastor of the church in Smyrna. And the, the day that he died, this bloodthirsty mob gathers in this arena, and um, 11 other Christians gave their lives that day that Polycarp did. And the way that Polycarp uh, died from this persecution from Rome against the church is uh, they were going to feed him to the lions, but they had actually put the lions away for the day and they didn't want the hassle of getting them back out. So what they decided to do was burn him at the stake. So they pile up some wood, put a stick in the middle and tie him to it. And uh, they're trying to get him to renounce his faith. If you just renounce your faith, Polycarp, de decide that Jesus isn't God and just say Caesar is Lord, then we'll let you live. And he refuses. And as he refuses to do this, they say, okay, well, we're going to burn you. And so they light the fire. And tradition says that the fire actually went around him, but it didn't touch him. And so then the Roman uh, officials became so enraged that they tell the, uh, the executioner, just stab him with a spear. And so they do, they, they, they stab him with it. And then so much blood came out that it put out the fire. Uh, and so he's just, just this crazy, crazy story. There's a lot of details. You can check out the story of, of Polycarp and how he gave his life for the Lord. But when uh, they were asking him to, uh, to, to, give, to, to renounce his faith in Jesus, here's what Polycarp said. He said, for 86 years, I've served Jesus. How dare I revile my king? He just wouldn't do it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't go back on his love for the Lord. You see, suffering and persecution has been one of the devil's favorite attacks on God's people. And here's what you have to know, that when you're in a time of suffering, because we're studying the suffering church, the persecuted church of Smyrna, when you're in a time of suffering, God has not abandoned you. He's actually very near to you. Here's our big idea as we look at Revelation 2, 8 through 11. Our suffering is empowered by Jesus and identifies us with Jesus. That when we go through suffering, Jesus actually gives us the strength to do it and to do it well. And when we suffer, we are identifying with him. Uh, so let's read Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. We'll read all the verses, and then we'll go back through and break it down. Revelation 2, 8 says this, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word together today. And we ask that as we do, that you would be glorified, that your name would be exalted, that you would be lifted up, and that we would do more than read words in a book on a page, but that we would actually meet with you. And that in meeting with you, you would change us to become more like you. So God, we ask that you would perform that miracle among us today to transform us and to uh, convict us and to encourage us and to cause us to be your people. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as we look at Revelation 2, 8 through 11, we're going to break it down into four parts together today, essentially looking at one part per verse. The first one's going to be verse 8, a vision from Jesus. The second one, verse 9, an encouragement from Jesus. The third part, uh, the, the basically three quarters of verse 10, a warning from Jesus. And then uh, the last piece of verse 10 and 11, a promise from Jesus. That's what we'll look, look at together today. Now, Revelation chapter 2 and 3 are seven individualized letters written to seven actual churches. And so Jesus has a letter and he writes it to the church and he explains some different things. And as he does so, look at verse eight, it's to the angel of the church. So the angel is the word messenger and it probably means pastor. And so Jesus has some stuff that he wants to say to the pastor of the church, but it's not just the pastor because the pastor is a representative of the people of the church. So he's actually talking to the church. And in this, what we, do, what we find ourselves here in chapter two is in the second part of Jesus' divine outline for the book of Revelation. Revelation 119, Jesus says this, write the things which you have seen, that's chapter one, and the things which are, that's chapters two and three, and the things which will take place after this, chapter four through the rest of the Bible. So Jesus actually gives us an outline for the book of Revelation in the book of Revelation. The things which are is the time of John's life, of these, and these seven churches in chapters two and three. Now these seven letters, they all follow a basic similar pattern. Not all, the, all of them have all the parts, but it's the same basic similar pattern where they have a four part structure. There's number one, a highlighted attribute of Jesus that we get from the vision that we saw in chapter one of Jesus. There is an encouragement that comes from Jesus. Number three, there's a correction that Jesus gives. And then number four, there's an eternal motivation that comes from Jesus as well. Now, if you noticed when we read our section together today, there was no correction. This is one of two churches that don't receive a correction from Jesus, but there is a warning that comes to this church. All right. Now, not only is there a four-part structure, but there's also a four-part application to all these uh, letters. Number one, it's locally to the church that Smyrna is an actual church, a real church in a real place in real history with real people that it's not some sort of fantasy or fairy tale, but it's uh, that church back then. Secondly, this applies broadly to any church at any time. Thirdly, this can apply to um, us personally, individually, anyone. Why? Because the church is not the building, it's not the organization, it's not the staff, it's the people. And so when Jesus writes a letter to the church, he's writing it to the people of the church. So you can apply this to your life individually. And then fourthly, this can apply, apply prophetically across church history as some people see these churches as representing eras or times of the church throughout church history. All right, let's jump in. Verse eight, a vision from Jesus in our first section today. Uh, it says this, and to the angel in the church of Smyrna, write. Now Jesus uh, in each of these letters, he opens them the same way. And as he does, he's addressing it to this place, this church, Smyrna. Uh, and this is actually the only biblical reference that we have to the church of Smyrna. We don't have Smyrna mentioned anywhere else, but we have a lot that is we can reference in terms of history. In fact, this city still exists today in Turkey. It's called Izmir. I don't know if that's how you say that. I don't speak Turkey language, whatever it is they speak there. I didn't research that. Uh, whatever they speak, I don't speak that. Izmir, I think that's how you say the name of the city. So you can go there today uh, and check it out. Now, uh, Smyrna was a large and beautiful city. It's a port city right on the water in a valley. All trade would come through Smyrna. Everything in the area would go through that city. So it was very wealthy. It also had a really large library, a 200,000 volume uh, library. So they were very knowledgeable. This city was also extremely idolatrous. They had lots and lots of different gods, which was common uh, in this era for the Romans to have lots of different types 
of gods. Now, a couple hundred years before Jesus, when Jesus was born, go back in time a couple hundred years, in Smyrna is where they first had this idea of worshiping the, the idea of national Rome or, or the, the nation of Rome. They, they called it the Dea Roma. And so they actually set up a temple and they would worship the idea of Rome, similar to if we were to maybe go and worship the Statue of Liberty. Not that we worship the statue, but that it represents America or something, and we worship the idea of America. And so they started doing that there in Smyrna. Now from there, they transitioned that into, well, let's worship the dead um, uh, Caesars, the dead leaders, as those who were, uh, they ascended into deity. And once they started doing that, it's not a big step to go one step further to say, well, the living Caesar is actually of the gods as well. So we're gonna, <clears throat> we're gonna worship this living Caesar as God in human flesh as well. And this is where in Smyrna, they actually initiated this idea of offering a pinch of incense every year. And uh, you would offer it in the temple and you would say, Caesar is Lord. Now that was a problem for Christians that doing that thing, they could live in the Roman Empire, they could be engaged in the culture to a certain degree, but as soon as it was now required for you to say Caesar is Lord and offer a pinch of incense, now they had a problem. Why? Because Lord was much more than just acknowledging someone's authority or position. This was saying, you are God. And as you can imagine, Christians can't do that because Lord is reserved for Jesus. Only Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. And so they wouldn't do it. And that cost them a lot because they refused to do that. That put them in conflict, in tension with their culture. They wouldn't do what the culture wanted. So it put them in conflict with the culture. And as a result, they become exiled. They become pushed out. A lot of the people who had different trades, they would be part of guilds at that time for their trade. They couldn't get work. So now they're left on the outskirts, barely surviving. It's a very, very big problem. Um, now, in this, uh, Jesus speaks to this suffering church who's about to go through more suffering by pointing to two significant details about himself. Look at verse 8. It says this, These things, says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. So Jesus says two things about himself. He says he's the first and the last. What he, what he means by that is when he says, I'm the first, what he's saying is before there was a first, I was there. And when there is a last, I'll still be there. He's pointing to his eternality, that he's, he's outside of time, that he is God. That's what he's pointing to. It's not, it's not like when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, we're about to celebrate that for Christmas here in a couple of months. Isn't that wild that that's coming up so quick? But uh, that, you know, we celebrate Christmas, Jesus born in a manger, that that's not when Jesus started. That, that's not when his life began. That Jesus didn't like get born and then he, he uh, kind of lived a good life and then he realized something's different about me. Maybe I'm really awesome. And then he said, I think I could be God. And then he just ascended into this Godhead. No, that's like, that's Greek mythology. That's not biblical Christianity. Jesus pre-existed his birth. And when he was born, he added humanity to his deity. He didn't stop being God. He continued to be God and became man at the same time. Here's a big, a really cool big theology word for you. Write it down, impress your friends. It's the hypostatic union. You can say, say that to people and they'll think you're super smart. You may not know what it means, but it doesn't matter. Uh, basically, it means Jesus is God and man at the same time, right? That, it's the mystery of who Jesus is. So his eternality and his deity is found in the first and last. But notice what he also says. He says, who was dead and came to life. Jesus is speaking there of his humanity and of his suffering. He's pointing to his own suffering as he talks to this suffering church, that Jesus is both infinite and he identifies. Think about that for a minute. The infinite God of all creation, the one who holds the universe in the span of his hand, identifies with your pain. He, he comes near to your suffering. What an amazing thing that Jesus says. Here's what it says in Hebrews 4, 15 about Jesus. For we do not have a high priest, speaking of Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus comes to this church and he's giving them some encouragement. Now, this would be a massive encouragement for them. Um, it's, it's like this, like if uh, there's a, a mom that's 
uh, first time mom and she's about to give birth and, and she's starting to show and you know her, um, her birth, the, the time of, of giving birth is coming and she's kind of thinking ahead to that suffering, right? And she's like, man, this is, this is gonna be crazy. And if I come to her and I'm like, listen, you know, it's gonna be okay. You're gonna get through it. And I know that it's kind of scary or you're not sure how it's all gonna go, but it, it'll be all right. If I come to her and say that, that'll maybe have some kind of uh, comfort for her. Probably not, because I don't know if you noticed, I'm a dude. But if my wife, Micah does, so my wife and kids are here with me today. Uh, if she goes to, to this new mom, this first time mom and says, hey, I know exactly what you're going through. I know exactly what's on the horizon. I know how this is going to go, and it's going to be okay. If she brings some encouragement, it carries a totally different weight because I have no idea what it's like to give birth, but she does. This, in the same way, Jesus is not speaking of their pain and suffering or your pain and suffering in terms of theory. Jesus doesn't identify with your pain theoretically. He knows exactly what it's like to go through pain. He knows exactly what it's like to suffer. He knows exactly what it's like to be persecuted. Jesus experienced the pain of the cost of sin. He experienced the pain of temptation. Jesus experienced the pain of grief. Jesus experienced what it is to be painfully rejected. He experienced the pain of betrayal. He experienced the pain of separation from his father. Jesus experienced the pain of physical torture. There is literally nothing you can experience that Jesus cannot identify with you in your pain in and to say, I know what that's like. And that brings a certain level of comfort. You see, he knows every kind of pain that we could face. Not only do we see a vision of Jesus, but secondly, we also see an encouragement from Jesus in verse nine. Look at verse nine. Jesus says this, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. Jesus knows. That's what he says here. He says to the church, I'm the first and last. I, uh, I uh, was dead and came to life. And he says, I know, and he knows three things. I know your works. I know your tribulation and I know your poverty. The word works there, that means that they're active, that they are busy, that even though they're being persecuted, even though they're in a position of pain, they're serving, they're ministering, they're doing something. They're not sitting back in their pain saying, well, I can't do anything because it hurts. Even in their pain, they're still serving somebody else. Jesus sees that. Secondly, he knows their tribulation, that even in the pressure of pain that they're facing, that as they try to live godly, that Jesus sees that this, there's this uh, tribulation that they're facing, this problem that's going on, this heart issue that's taking place where they're struggling with it, that they're, they're having um, this tribulation in their life, both internally and externally. And then thirdly, Jesus says, I know your poverty. Now this word poverty, it doesn't mean like, you know, the people down the street on, on your street, they have a nicer car, so I must be poor. It's not the kind of poverty that he's talking about. This is abject poverty. Like, I don't know if I'm going to eat today kind of poverty. Like, I might die this week because I don't have basic necessities that are being met. We, most of us have no idea what this is. We, we identify with this in, in theory, like, yeah, that's kind of an idea. I mean, in Tampa, where we, uh, we, we live, uh, there was just a uh, hurricane that came through, and we were without power for a week, and we're like, poverty, abject poverty, you know, like... We can't plug in our refrigerator. And do you know what it's like to sleep in Florida with no uh, air conditioning? Uh, it's like murder, right? But these people are experiencing something way beyond any of that kind of stuff. This is absolute abject poverty. And Jesus says, I know that. And why are they experiencing this? Because of Roman persecution, because they're Christians. And Jesus says, I know that you're experiencing this. Now, when I go into times of pain and suffering, my initial response, the first thing I want is I want to get out of the suffering as fast as humanly possible. That's all I want. I, I want comfort. I want nice things. I want unicorns. I want puppy dogs. I want rainbows. That's what I want in my life. I don't want pain. I don't want problem. I mean, I don't really want unicorns, and, but I have girls, so they like that stuff. So that's what I look for, all right? That's what I want. And, and, that, and yet pain comes into my life, and what do I do with it? Well, when times of pain and times of struggle and times of, of suffering come into my life, I'm tempted to do two things with it. I'm tempted in two ways. I'm tempted to believe that God is not all-powerful. God couldn't have stopped it, that he couldn't do anything about this. So I'm, now I'm in this situation, and it's because God didn't stop it. 
Or if I think that God is, if I believe God's powerful enough, maybe he's not good enough. And he just didn't do it because he doesn't like me. Or maybe he doesn't like redhead, you know, I'm his redheaded stepchild. And, you know, I, maybe I did something wrong. Or maybe he's mad at me. Or maybe I should have done this and I should have done that. And that somehow God's against me. I'm tempted to believe those things. And the, the truth of the matter is that that is absolutely not true at all. We, here, I'll package it this way. We are tempted to believe that either God is incompetent or indifferent. That's what we're tempted to believe when pain is in our lives. And we have to be very careful to hold on to the truth and the reality that Jesus remains in control and he remains absolutely good even in our pain. Notice Jesus says there, you're, they, I know that you are uh, poor, but uh, you are rich. See that there in verse nine? You see, though every outward appearance is extreme poverty, Jesus estimates that their trust in him is true wealth. He says, your faith is where true wealth is found. That how you spend your time, how you spend your talent, how you spend your treasure, it can be an eternal investment. That even though they have literally nothing, they have nothing financially or of the world to give, Jesus says, you're extremely wealthy because he's looking from an eternal perspective. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Jesus says it like this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, Jesus just sees it differently. He just sees our riches differently. He sees our wealth differently. Jesus sees riches that cannot rust he sees wealth that cannot wither and stuff that cannot be stolen. And the way that you send it ahead to heaven is by living by faith in him. That the way you do the things that you do, the motivation that you have, how you use your life is actually an eternal investment. And also, Jesus doesn't just know this, these three things, but secondly, he knows, see that verse nine? I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, Jesus is saying something really huge here. You see, the Christians in Smyrna were not just persecuted by the culture in general, but also by those who claimed to be the people of God, the Jews. Now, if there was anybody in any sort of religious group who would be in this, uh, be close in, as, as close as possible to salvation in the Lord, it would be the Jews. They have the same Old Testament scripture. They have the same scriptures that they did. They have the same God. They have the same uh, belief system that's looking for the Messiah. They just missed that the Messiah is Jesus. And so Jesus looks at this and he says that he knows that they are persecuting you. Here's how Warren Wiersbe says it. The Jewish synagogue was actually a synagogue of Satan. A true Jew is not one physically or racially, but spiritually, Romans 2, 17 through 29. Any religious group, Jewish or Gentile, that does not acknowledge Jesus Christ as God's son is certainly acting contrary to God's will. Now, now here's, listen to what Jesus is saying here. He's saying something really, really big. What he's saying is that all religion, apart from the Jesus of the Bible. Now, we have to say the Jesus of the Bible, right? Because there are a lot of Jesuses out there. there I mean, there's, a, there's a, a, a Mormon Jesus. He's not the Jesus of the Bible. There's a Jehovah's Witness Jesus. He's not the Jesus of the Bible. There's a Muslim Jesus. There might be a guy on your street named Jesus, and he's not Jesus either, right? Like your neighbor, or maybe you're here, Jesus. Hey, good to see you. Uh, but the, the, the reality is, that's not Jesus. When we say Jesus, we mean the Jesus of the Bible. We have to clarify it that way. And so any religion, any religious expression, apart from the Jesus of the Bible, no matter how seemingly nice, no matter how sincere, is actually satanic deception. That's the only right category for it. There's no category where they're, well, maybe they're kind of sort of gonna be Christians or they're, you know, God will sort it out one day. No, there's two categories, in Christ and not in Christ. That's it. So if you're not in the Jesus of the Bible, you're not in Christ. You might be nice. You might be a good person as far as your idea of what a good person is, but you are not saved. Does that make sense? Jesus says it's a synagogue of Satan. It's a, it's a satanic deception and counterfeit. 
That when Jesus here, as he says, he knows, notice that there, he says, I know your works and I know the blasphemy and the, and the synagogue of Satan. When Jesus says he knows, it's a call for us to trust him. That even when it hurts, even when it doesn't make sense, we can trust Jesus. All right, thirdly, we see a vision from Jesus, an encouragement from Jesus. Thirdly, we see a warning from Jesus in verse 10. It says this, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. You see, the devil had a plan for their suffering, but so did Jesus. You see that there? Jesus has a plan for their suffering. Now, we tend to put all suffering into the category of evil. If suffering comes into my life, if pain comes into my life, it's evil, it's bad, it's wasted, it's wrong, it's what should not be. That's what we tend to think of when we think of, of pain. But, and while that might be true of some pain in our lives, what if Jesus used more of it for our good than we thought? What if more of that pain was actually a blessing from God or a thing that God would use to be a blessing in your life in ways that you wouldn't imagine? Here's how uh, 2 Timothy 3.12 says it. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I don't really see very many doilies with this knitted on it. You know, the holding on to the promises of the Lord. Right? I'm going to suffer persecution, right? Like that's not really a thing that I'm looking for as a promise, but it's a promise. If you want to live a godly life, you will suffer persecution. And I fear that the reason that some of us don't suffer any sort of problem or pain or persecution is because we're just going with the flow. We're, we're just going with the flow of things. Because if you do that, you're never going to get in a head-on collision with Satan, are you? It's not until you start swimming upstream, you start going against the flow of the culture, against the flow of things, that's when you have problems. 1 Peter 4.13 says, Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to the world. That somehow your suffering unites you with Jesus' suffering, and you have a more intimate relationship with him through that pain that he takes it and he creates something beautiful out of it. Now, Jesus here does not call his church to avoid suffering. Do you see it there? Look at, at verse 10. Do not fear, fear any of those things you're about to suffer. In the, indeed, the devil's about to throw you into prison. So he said, he's not calling them to avoid the suffering, but he's calling them to faithful suffering by not giving in to fear. That's, why, that's what he starts with. Do not fear. He's saying, Go through the, the suffering in a faith-filled way. Now, when Jesus says, do not fear, he's not saying, don't be afraid, like, don't be afraid of the dark. Um, you know, like the dark, it's not actually going to hurt you. There's nothing really there. Uh, my wife and I, we moved uh, with our kids to Denver, planted a church there. Uh, we were there for nine years. And uh, uh, as we were there, one of the things in Denver is that all of the houses pretty much have a basement. And one of my favorite things to do was to go down into the basement with the kids because they had to look for something. And then I would shut off the lights and run upstairs real fast. And they're like, blah, you know, losing their minds. I'm just laughing. I, Don't call CPS, okay? They're fine. They're, they're bigger now. They might have some problems, but uh, we can talk to them about it later. Uh, just why? Because there's nothing in the dark. It's not going to get you. You know, it's not like you get to the bottom step of the, of the stairs to step into the basement and then as soon as you do, death. You know, like that's just not how it works. But there's something in them that's afraid of that. Jesus is not saying don't be afraid like don't be afraid of the dark because there's a very real fear. Imagine this. If the government came in while we're having church here and arrested all of us and half of you were executed, that's something to be afraid of. That's a legitimate fear. That's a very real thing to be afraid of. Jesus is not saying don't feel fear. That's not what he's saying. That's not what this is. A, a way that this could be translated is stop being afraid. What this is, is that when you feel fear, do something with it. Do the right thing with it. It's like this. Every person, everyone that's, that's human, a common human trait is to have faith, that you have some faith. Now, maybe you're here and you're a guest and uh, you're just visiting. You're not sure about this whole church thing or whatever. We're so glad you're here. Uh, I'm so glad that you've taken time to be here. Uh, and maybe you say, I'm agnostic or I'm atheist. I don't have any faith. And what I would argue is, yes, you do. You're just putting it in a place that I'm not putting mine. 
that, that you have faith, you're just directing it somewhere. And here's what fear does. Fear gets you to misplace your faith. It directs your faith to the wrong place. That's what fear does. And what Jesus is saying is not don't feel fear. He's saying don't be controlled by fear. Instead of being controlled by fear, practice self-control. Why? Because a faith that is rightly, rightly placed is only placed in Jesus. And fear is going to try to get you to put your faith in a lot of other things. But you have to fight to keep it placed in Jesus. So Jesus points to, in verse 10 there, the devil as the one responsible for the church's persecution. Look at it there. It says, do not fear for the things that you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. The devil's the one that's responsible. Now, from the outside, it would look like it's the culture or the government or the Jews, but Jesus says it's actually Satan. There's actually a spiritual reality happening behind the scenes that you can't see, and what you see being taken, uh, see happening in, in the, the physical is actually happening in the spiritual. Some of the church would be targeted and imprisoned, and this is a satanic tactic used to incite fear as a weapon to paralyze the church. And Jesus knows it's going to happen. Uh, my Bible doesn't say this, maybe yours does, but my Bible doesn't say uh, you're about to be thrown into prison by the devil, and if you just pray really hard, then you won't go through it. Does your Bible say that? Or does it say, if you shout at the devil, then he'll run away and you won't ever have Satan do anything bad to you? Does, it, does yours say that? My Bible does not say that. What my Bible says is pain is coming, Jesus knows, and he's going to allow it. That's what my Bible says. Some people do not have a theology for this because they think if anything that comes into your life that's suffering or pain in any way, then it's your fault because you didn't have enough faith. What a, what a lie. What another tactic of Satan to twist the scriptures and to make you believe something that's not true. The truth is Jesus knows that this pain is coming. And instead of saying, you can just avoid all of it if you had enough faith, what he says is, put your faith in me and I'll go through it with you. I'll be there with you through all of it. Um, he, he, uh, the, the, the reality that Jesus is pointing to is this, that when you're controlled by fear, you cannot live by faith. And so you have to direct the faith the right way. You have to put that in submission uh, to the things of the Lord. And when, uh, faith is not a weapon that we wield against suffering to avoid it. Why? Why is this all going to happen? Well, he says there in verse 10, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison. That, do you see the word that in your Bible there in verse 10? That's the reason why. That you may be tested. That you may be tested. You see, Jesus is using this pain in their lives as a way to test their faith. Now, the idea of Jesus testing or your faith being tested by the, God, by the Lord, it's a way to um, prove your faith. That True biblical faith trusts that God has redeeming purpose in our suffering. That's what, that's what Jesus does with our faith. True biblical faith is not avoiding suffering. The, why? Because a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. That if you can't actually tr test your faith, you can't trust it. It's like if you were to go into chair making. I don't know how you make chairs, but you take some wood, you whittle it down or whatever, and you're like, oh, I have a chair. Now, once you produce the chair, the way that you decide, did I do a good job is, you sit on the chair. <laughs> That's what you do. That's the moment of testing. And if you did a bad job, the chair falls apart and you go to the hospital. But if you did a good job, it holds you and it's a chair and it's good, right? The, the, in the same way, you have to be able to rest in your faith. You actually have to put weight down on your faith to see if you actually believe it. And if you can't test your faith, then it's useless faith. It's not real faith. Now, the testing of your faith doesn't cause your faith to become real. It reveals that your faith is actually real. It's the theology that we work out in the daytime is proved in the nighttime. That when things are clear and sunny and good and we read the scriptures and we establish who God is, don't abandon the goodness and the strength and the power of God just because the storm comes, just because the night comes. That we can hold on to him in the, uh, still through it all. It's like this, if I was to step on a skunk, then I'm gonna probably have a problem. I'm probably gonna end up stinky. That's what's gonna happen because, you know, skunks have stench. Now me putting pressure on the skunk doesn't create the stench, it reveals the stench. That's what it does. And so too, pressure in your life doesn't reveal or doesn't produce what's inside, it reveals what's inside. 
And so as God puts them in this position of trial, of, of pressure, of pain, of suffering, it's to prove their faith, to shore up their faith. It also is going to reveal some stuff that they don't really want to see, and that's going to be an opportunity to purify them, to remove those things from their lives. Now, at the end of verse 10 there, it says this. Uh, it says uh, that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Now, this idea of 10 days there's lots of weird ideas that people have about this. Commentators say so many things. They do lots of weird mathematic gymnastics to say stuff. I'm a simple guy. I'm going to offer you two ideas of what I think it probably means, all right? Um, one is that 10 days could mean, you ready for it? 10 days. <laughs> think about that. That would blow your mind. 10 days could mean 10 days. The other thing that it could mean is um, it, there's actually a, a Greek euphemism that they would use in their language for 10 days, and it would mean a short period of time. Now, there's some other stuff where, you know, you look at church history, and there were 10 Roman emperors that persecuted the church really hard. I mean, it could mean that stuff. It could. Yeah, okay, whatever. But it probably means 10 days. That's probably what, it, what it's all about. All right. So uh, we have a vision for, of Jesus, an encouragement from Jesus, a warning from Jesus. And then fourthly and finally, a promise from Jesus Verse 10, and the end of verse 10 and 11, it says this, be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now here, Jesus says that there are two rewards for faithful suffering. You wanna, if you suffer well, faithfully in the Lord, there are two rewards that you can hope for. Verse 10, it says, be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of of life. There is a crown as a reward. That The Bible speaks of rewards, and there are actually five crowns uh, that are mentioned in the Bible. I'm not going to tell you where they are. You can find them on your own. There's a Bible study for you. Find the crowns. Check out what they have to say about them. Now, this one, this crown, it's not the crown of a king. Jesus is going to get that crown later on in the book of Revelation. This is the victor's crown, kind of like the Olympics, where they would weave the wreath together, you know, that little... Uh, leafy thing, and they'd put it on their head because they won their event at the Olympics, that crown, the victor's crown. Now, when Jesus says this, this is actually a paradox. Look at that. Jesus says there at the end of verse 10, be faithful until death, and I'll give you the crown of life, right? Death and life are juxtaposed as this paradox, but also is the idea of the crown itself. Because think about this. If you're faithful until death, that means that they actually execute you for your faith that would probably put you in the category of victim, right? And Jesus says, when you're persecuted, you're not the victim. When you're faithful, you're actually the victor in him. So don't look, think of even just the cross of Christ himself. It looked like a loss. It looked like Jesus was bleeding and dying and everything was over. In fact, his disciples thought that and they were freaking out about it. But Jesus turned the entire thing on its head when he rises from the dead, and he turns the thing that looked like he was a victim into the very thing that's our victory, that through his cross, we have life. That's amazing what Jesus does. And so he promises this crown um, as a, 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 um, a reward for faithful suffering, that there are those who give their lives, and they're not victims, but they're victorious in Jesus. And he celebrates those who die for him with a special reward. Now, secondly, verse 11, there's an eternal reward. It's at the end of verse 11. It says this, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, when you read the word overcomes, he who overcomes, there's a couple ways you could read that. One is to say, yeah, he who overcomes, I'm an overcomer, just like Nike, just do it. I'm strong enough. I'm good enough. And gosh darn it, people like me, right? Or whatever that movie. You remember that movie? That weird movie? Anyway, no, you're too young. I'm old now. So anyway, there's this, this idea where we feel like we're, if I'm the overcomer, I've just got to be strong enough. I've got to be good enough. I've got to have the strength in myself. I've got to make myself capable and possible and able. And if I do that, then I'm the overcomer. That, that the reality is you're not a champion, you're a chump. That's the truth. The overcomer's not you, it's Jesus. That I stand in his victory. That where I failed, he wins. That where I'm weak, he's strong. The overcoming isn't my ability, it's his. That Jesus takes my sin, my defeat, my loss, and he turns it into a win. That's who Jesus is. 
The overcomer is those who have faith in Jesus, that it's his death on my behalf. The only thing I contributed to my salvation is the sin and the garbage. Here, Jesus, take my broken life. And he says, I will. And he trades me for his perfection. That's incredible. That's being an overcomer. And what does Jesus say? You cannot be hurt by the second death. That hell is not a reality for those who place their faith in Jesus. You see, when the reality of heaven is in view, then the suffering of today becomes a sacrifice of praise to Jesus. That I can actually use the suffering, I can use the, sacri- the, the pain in my life to praise Jesus with it, that I'm no longer a victim. Now, Jesus says there at the beginning of verse 11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That Jesus' message was not just for them back then, but was for us here today. You know how I know? Reach up, grab the side of your head. You have an ear? It's for you. It's for me. Now, what he doesn't mean is that if you have a physical ear on the side of your face. What he means is if you're willing to receive what he has to say, uh, if, you, if you're in that boat. Here's how David Guzik says it. It's always amazing how two people can come and sit down and read the same passage of the Bible or hear the same message and one can go away blessed and the other one can go away with nothing. It's not because there was a difference in the word that was preached. It was the same thing that they both heard. It's because they, one had ears to hear and the other didn't. That's the difference. So do you have ears to hear what Jesus has to say to you? The question is not if Jesus has a message. The question is, are you willing to hear it? You see, Jesus was faithful in his suffering. He took your sin. He took your shame. He took your place on the cross and he paid for your sin and shame with his blood. Jesus has overcome for you so that you might overcome in him. And because of Jesus' overcoming faithfulness for you, you can trust that he knows about your suffering. He knows about your pain and he's with you in it. Because of Jesus' overcoming faithfulness, you can be faithful until death. That he can empower you to be faithful till death. Whether that death is soon or decades from now, he can empower you for faithfulness until that time. Because of Jesus overcoming faithfulness, you can live and die with the hope of not being hurt by the second death, that you have no fear of hell, but the future of heaven because of Jesus. The hope of living a faithful life today and an eternal life in the future is tied to your faith in Jesus, that he died for you, he rose for you to purchase you with his blood. So the question is this, is your faith in Jesus? Have you put your faith in Jesus, to trust him, to save you, to redeem you. If you haven't and you have questions about that or you want to pray with somebody about that, we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to help you and answer questions about that. And if you have, here's the question for you. How does your life reflect that faith? Can anybody tell, especially when you're going through pain, that your faith is in Jesus? I hope that they can. (laughs) 